Hello and welcome to Fukushima Daiichi and the Ocean, 10 years of study and insight. I'm Miles O'Brien and I'm your host. So where were you 10 years ago next week? 3-11-11. I'm sure all of you have a ready answer. The Great Tohoku Earthquake is one of those events etched in stone in our collective memories. But of course, that was just the beginning of the story. And 10 years later, it is still unfolding. So let's look back, let's assess the present, and let's see what the ten year, next 10 years may hold with some scientific experts who know the story well. And we'll spend some time talking about how we should talk about Fukushima and its environmental impact. <clears throat> but before we go any further, let's pause and reflect for a few moments to acknowledge the terrible loss of life as a result of the devastating earthquake and tsunami. May they all rest in peace. Before we begin, some tips on how you can optimize your experience with us on Zoom. At the end of the program, our panelists will be taking questions from all of you. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and type your questions in that window that appears. You may be more familiar with the chat function in Zoom. For tonight though, please use the Q&A function instead. We expect a lot of questions, so I apologize if we don't get to yours while we're live. You can ask questions any, anytime, starting now. Finally, I want to remind you that in addition to this event, there is a virtual poster session everyone is invited to join. Poster sessions are often part of scientific conferences where scientists share their most recent research. You can find the virtual poster session by going to the URL on the screen, clicking the link at the top of the page, You'll find 40 posters, each of which includes audio in Japanese and English describing the research. I'm a journalist and filmmaker who focuses on science and technology. The Tohoku earthquake and the devastation it brought touched on several aspects of my beat, earthquakes and tsunamis, how possibly to predict them, and nuclear power, how it works, how it doesn't. My first reporting trip to Japan after the earthquake was in July of 2011. Tokyo, as usual, was hot, but the thermostats were set high and the lights were dimmed to conserve energy. Japan's big bet on nuclear power was already over, a big loss in so many ways, but that was just for starters. On my way to the exclusion zone, I realized the full scope and depth of the disaster. Coastal communities were leveled for hundreds of miles. People were sifting through the wreckage, looking for whatever might have been left of their belongings. The breadth and depth of it is impossible to convey in a film or on television. And then in the exclusion zone, I traveled with an elderly couple to a home a little more than a kilometer from the plant that had been in his family for 500 years. With our cameras rolling, their stoic Japanese facade crumbled in tears and heaving sobs. They were never coming home, and that was the moment that it hit them. Our keynoter today has spent a lot of time meeting with victims of the Fukushima meltdowns. In her role as the U.S. ambassador to Japan, she traveled all throughout the exclusion zone and toured the stricken facility. She visited the control room where heroic plant operators worked against long odds to try to stop the meltdowns, all the while in the dark, convinced they would die. She told reporters afterward, we stand ready to help in any way we can. She is here tonight to help us put the science into a broader context. It is our honor to hear from Caroline Kennedy. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this important mm -hmm. forum. I want to thank Woods Hole for helping the world understand the consequences of the tragedy of 311 and for their continuing work to protect the oceans on which our lives depend. When the great East Japan earthquake happened in 2011, I had yet to imagine that I would one day serve as the United States ambassador to Japan. 
Like millions of people, I was transfixed by the unfolding disaster on TV and its terrible consequences. But it was happening far away in a different ocean in a country that we were told had the resources to manage its problems. And its magnitude was hard to comprehend. After the initial day days, it faded from my television, but I didn't realize how deeply it would affect my life. Two and a half years later, only 10 days after I got to Japan, I made my first trip to the Tohoku region. The aftermath of the devastation was staggering. As we drove from town to town, piles of rubble and wooden beams lined the roads. In flat, empty fields of dirt, the outlines of houses could still be seen, and shells of concrete buildings with wires dangling in the wind stuck out from the barren landscape. I knew that almost 20,000 people had lost their lives, and around 400,000 had been rendered homeless. The coastline was about 350 miles long, but those statistics were somewhat abstract. What I had not been able to comprehend from afar was the immensity of the suffering. In one of the most beautiful landscapes I'd ever seen, the feelings of loss and isolation were still overwhelming. On that first visit, we stopped at Minami Sanrikyu, a town in which well over half the residents had been killed. The schools were located on the hillsides above town, so the children who were in school that day survived, but they watched as their homes and families were washed away. I met the mayor who had lost his own wife and children, and we gathered in front of a 200-year-old pine tree that was the only one in its forest of 70,000 trees to weather the storm, and it became a symbol of strength and resilience for the nation. At the end of the day, we visited a temporary housing center where elderly and isolated women gathered to share a meal and some conversation. They had decided to crochet and sell small sea creatures, cheerful little scallops, squid, starfish, and fish, all of which their husbands used to bring home in their nets at the end of the day before they had been killed. It was cold and dark outside, and they cried as they talked about the fact that they would never be able to return home. It was one of the saddest experiences I've ever had, partly because the women were so grateful that I had visited and so eager to share and thank me for all the help America had provided. And that was true everywhere I went. Most Americans don't realize how much the support provided by the United States at that time still means to the Japanese people. Operation Tomodachi, meaning friend, gave life and hope to the disaster-stricken region. From March 12th until May 4th, over 24,000 service members, 189 airplanes, 24 ships, including the Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier, conducted search and rescue missions, cleared wreckage, dredged harbors, donated and distributed hundreds of thousands of pounds of supplies, water, and food including 500,000 gallons of water to cool the water at Fukushima Daiichi. And they assisted the Japanese military in disaster relief efforts. Everywhere I went for the next three years, ordinary citizens and Japanese government officials asked me to thank the people of the United States for coming to their aid in their time of need. The effort had a profound impact on the service members who participated, many of whom stayed in touch with recovery efforts in the region. Both sides learn from each other in ways that will continue to benefit the Alliance as these individuals move through their careers in the military. In the years preceding 311, as America tackled the Great Recession at home and fought multiple wars in the Middle East, people in Asia had started to wonder whether the US was really a reliable ally. But America's immediate and comprehensive response to the triple disaster of 311 did more for the reputation of the United States and Japan and throughout the Asia than any strategy we could have possibly planned. And the outpouring of gratitude and goodwill allowed the Alliance to reach new levels of cooperation and effectiveness across the board. It wasn't just the military, it was an all of government response led by the Department of Energy, which provided critical assistance and institutions like Woods Hole strengthened their partnerships with the scientific community in Japan. The fledgling nonprofit sector in Japan was also given a boost. 
the U.S. Embassy, American and Japanese companies, nonprofits, and social entrepreneurs created the Tomodachi Initiative to empower Japanese women and connect students from the isolated Tohoku region with their American counterparts. A few months after that first visit, I returned to see the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. We saw the spent fuel rods being carefully removed and the vast numbers of storage tanks for the contaminated groundwater. And another sign of the importance of America's response. I was the first visitor since the Japanese prime minister two years earlier to be taken into the control room where it was still possible to see the scratches that the engineers had made on the wall in the dark to mark the rising water levels as they realized the enormity of what was happening. It was truly terrifying. At that moment, I made a personal commitment to visit the region frequently, not only because of what I could offer, but because of what I received. Each time I went, I was inspired by the resilience and courage of the residents. I wanted to help them spread the word that it was safe to visit, to eat the local food and fish, and show the communities that America had not forgotten all that they had been through. I spoke to Japanese Peace Corps type volunteers, local businesses, uh, and coffee shops. I threw out a pitch at a baseball game and talked to lots of students about coming to study in the US. And along with fellow diplomats and military, I participated in a tour to Tohoku, a bike ride which was intended to encourage visitors to return to the region. Local villagers welcomed us along the way, sharing delicacies fresh from the ocean, and we joined them to offer prayers at the memorial altars at the villages we rode through. The spiritual dimension of the recovery efforts made the greatest impression on me. In many, the many ways the communities honored those they'd lost and worked for a better future was a profound lesson. And each time I visited, I was reminded of how much we have in common with people whose lives may be very different from our own. Our joys and sorrows, our dependence on nature, and our desire for our children to have a better life. And to circle back to the topic today, the ways in which we are connected to people who live continents away by the same oceans that separate us. One of the most powerful instances of that connection is the story of the Kasagi Gates of Hachinoe. In 2013, two years after 311, and one month apart, two large pieces of wood washed up on the shores of Oregon. It took months to figure out that they were the cross beams of a sacred shrine in Japan, of which there are thousands erected along the coastline at every village uh, to protect the fishermen out at sea. No one had any idea which towns they were from and only one had any markings on it that would be could serve as clues. So after two more years of effort, painstaking reconstruction and preservation, trips to Japan to try to figure out where they might be from and amateur detective work by the Portland Japanese garden the gates finally were returned to Japan. I attended the welcome ceremony at the port of Yokohama, where Shinto priests from the ancient Sugoroka Hachimangu Shrine purified and sanctified the gates in April 2016. Thanks to new friends from Oregon and Aomori, they were installed in the remote village of Hachinoe, overlooking the ocean that had carried them 7,000 miles away proving that the ocean does make us all part of one human family. Thank you, and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you very much, Caroline. That was uh, a beautiful talk. I, um, it really struck me on a personal level because uh, I had the opportunity to tour that control room uh, around the same time frame you did. And it was one of the most moving events uh, I, I've ever experienced. And um, I can only imagine what it was like for you. You were there with your son. I have a son the same age. I wonder what that was like uh, to be there with him and what his view of it is as a member of, you know, of the millennial generation, as it were. Well, he is, um, as perhaps your children are, I think, uh, really passionate about 
uh, the environment and um, and and passionate about the ocean. So he was really interested and I thought uh, that it would be a special experience for him. So I wanted to time the visit when he was in Japan visiting. And I think both of us, it was a very solemn day and, um, and learning about the imagining, being able to imagine what it was like for the people inside there and how hard they fought. Um, I think we all heard so many conflicting stories about that because it was so complex, but uh, certainly to imagine a world um, where these kinds of disasters are more frequent is <clears throat> frightening. And then the heroism of the people inside who use flashlights and brought their car batteries in to try to um, mark the um, water levels and try to prevent the uh, meltdown from going all the way was um, really chilling. So I think you can't leave an experience like that without feeling like you have some sort of obligation in whatever way you can to, to you know, work to for the environment or uh, to increase our scientific understanding uh, because this is really an enormous challenge. Yeah, I think seeing those pencil markings and scratchings on the green control panels, it really struck me uh, of what, you know, what a dire situation they were in the middle of. The other thing that struck me, I, I had the chance to speak with the, uh, the 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 head operator who was there at the time, in the in the place where he was trying to save everything. And you, I'm sure you gathered this insight in your time in Japan, but it, it was a bit of a revelation for me at the time, is that in, in Japan there is this sense of collective responsibility that we don't have here. He took a, a burden of guilt and blame on him personally for that event, which really struck me. I wonder if you ha had noticed that and what your thoughts are on that. Well, by the time I got to Japan, it was two years later, but uh, the people who were still at TEPCO, who um, whatever mistakes they had made in the past still felt so personally responsible for trying to fix the situation, improve the situation, take blame, take responsibility. Um, you know, day in and day out. It was very sobering to, to watch them carry that weight uh, around. And I think, um, you know, and going in, as I'm sure you did, having your radiation level measured before you go in, and then again, when you come out um, and beginning to understand that, you know, I mean, it was, it was really frightening and that was two years later, but then when you meet these people who are uh, fishing and mm -hmm. trying to grow food and, and the levels are acceptable, but nobody, everybody is scared to, to buy their food or their fish, um, you know, understandably so in many cases. Uh, it's, I think that um, it's a real lesson in many, many levels mm -hmm. that we can learn from. So I'm so glad that this discussion is happening tonight. Um, and I think that this whole episode is something that um, as we piece apart uh, has many lessons for different areas of disaster response as well as sort of personal and collective responsibility and science, of course. Absolutely. You know, the decommissioning of Fukushima is a multi-decade event, uh, 20, 50 beyond, who knows. Um, what? What is, in your view, is the appropriate way for the U.S. Uh, to offer assistance marching forward? The Japanese, it's, it's a wealthy nation with incredible engineering talent. What is our role to play? Well, I think we've learned a lot from it also. And the larger question is, what role does nuclear power play in the uh, battle against global warming? Because um, Japan, as we know, has no real sources of energy. Um, so they had bet heavily on nuclear. Now they have no nuclear reactors, but they've set ambitious climate goals. So um, this is something that we all need to grapple with and we can't just act like it's somebody else's problem. Here in the United States, our reactors are aging. Um, so I think that the sharing of knowledge between the US and Japanese scientific communities has benefited both sides. Our scientists learned a lot from studying this process. Um, the Japanese also have uh, other kinds of nuclear facilities. So I think that the most important thing is that um, the transparency and collaboration between the scientists in both countries has benefited both communities and hopefully that will continue. 
it is a zero carbon source of energy in a place where resources are scant and even the ability to do solar and wind is difficult, right? Right, we actually visited at the same time they had a demonstration floating uh, wind turbine that they had installed mm -hmm. off of Fukushima because there was no fishing or anything allowed off the coast at that time. Um, that particular project didn't go ahead, but I know that there are others. And so it's an interesting as we in the United States grapple with the future of wind power and offshore uh, wind, certainly um, not far from what's hold. Uh, how are we gonna do that without causing uh, too much disruption to ocean life? So, so I think Japan has grappled with some of these challenges before we have, and so we can learn from their experience. I believe there were uh, 54 reactors at the time of the event. I think nine are now clear to open. I think only four or five are. In a sense, it's a, it's a huge wasted investment and resource, especially when you consider the, the measures that have been taken to retrofit many of these plants. Well, the attitude, I mean, towards nuclear power, uh, anything nuclear in Japan obviously is something uh, extremely um, central to their identity, if you will, um, between, I was there when President Obama visited Hiroshima, which was the sort of other bookend of my um, time in Japan. So both of those involved obviously uh, nuclear, um, episodes and um and so you can really understand how difficult this is in japan as an issue on so many many levels so it's complicated but m many things are in japan for sure uh, caroline kennedy thank you so much for sharing your uh insights with us uh on this special night and uh we thank you for for your service to our country thank you Let's take a step back and begin at the beginning. <clears throat> what really happened at Fukushima? The sequence of events is dramatic, to say the least. Three meltdowns, three hydrogen explosions, the venting of radionuclides into the air, and of course, the release of lots of very hot water. Significant amounts of radionuclides made their way into the Pacific through direct discharge or atmospheric deposition. But the radiation levels dropped pretty quickly. We know this thanks in large part to our next speaker, who organized and led several research expeditions in coastal waters off Fukushima. He is currently a professor at the Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology. Please welcome Dr. Joda Kanda. Okay, thank you, Miles. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, I'd like to talk about what happened in accident of Fukushima 10 years ago. First, I will briefly review the power plant and then talk about the earthquake and tsunami, the damage to the reactor units, and the re release of radionuclides. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant has six reactors from unit one, units one to six. Unit one went into operation in March 1971. The place was originally a wide plateau around the coast at an altitude of about 30 meters. And the coast was somewhat like a cliff. Our power plant was built by excavating the place down to about 10 meters above sea level. Although a tsunami was expected, the maximum water level was estimated to be only 6.1 meters. This has some consequences. 10 years ago, at 40, at 14.46 on March 11th, there was an earthquake which exceeded magnitude nine in Richter scale. It is one of the largest earthquakes in the world to date. In particular, uh, many people were killed in the subsequent tsunami. I have shown some of the uh, casualties caused by the tsunami that occurred in Japan in the past. In addition, more than 200,000 people were killed in the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. We can see the devastating effect of tsunami. Around 1537, the tsunami reached the power plant. The water level exceeded 10 or 15 meters. 
the emergency generators and batteries were flooded and lost. At the, at the power plant, the power supply was cut off due to the earthquake. So the fission reaction was immediately stopped and the water supply by the emergency generator was generator started. Nuclear fuel contains various radioactive substances. And even if the fission reaction stops, the radioactive material continue to generate heat. You have to keep cooling by water for quite a long period. If the emergency power is lost, cooling water cannot be supplied and the heat will cause more and more water to be lost. The temperature of the fuel will continue to rise. When metal reacts with water at high temperatures, hydrogen gas is generated. If the temp temperature rises further, the nuclear fuel, fuel will melt, causing core meltdown. The melted fuel will damage the vessels. Hydrogen gas leaks from there, and eventually it reacts with oxygen in the air and causes a hydrogen explosion. In Fukushima, Unit 1 to 4 had an accident. Unit 1 lost all emergency power and melted down a serious midnight of March 11. And a hydrogen explosion occurred in the afternoon of the following day. In Unit 2, one emergency system supplied water without uh, using electricity. However, this system <clears throat> stopped on March 14 and melted down at midnight. Only Unit 2 escaped from hydrogen explosion, however. At Unit 3, the emergency battery survived. Uh, and the cooling continued by, the electors, by this electricity. However, the electricity in the battery was exhausted on the next day. The meltdown occurred in the, mid, in the night of March 13th. And the hydrogen exploded on March 14th. At Unit 4, Nuclear fuel had been removed from the reactor during regular maintenance. However, the hydrogen generated at Unit 3 flowed into the building, causing a hydrogen explosion in the early morning of the March 15th. With these damages to the reactors, radionuclides were released. There are various radionuclides in the reactors. Mostly volatile and water-soluble elements were leaked. In the following talks, cesium-137 will frequent, frequently appear. Uh, cesium-137 has a longer life period, and a large amount of this was released. Iodine-131 and other substances have a much shorter lifespan. Although strontium and tritium have a relatively long life period, the release was much smaller than cesium. These elements leak from the damaged reactor and, and are released into the atmosphere. In order to lower the pressure inside the vessels, they performed an operation called vent to release the gas. This also causes radionuclide release into the atmosphere. They also tried to supply water to cool the reactor, but the water leaked, in, leaked and accumulated in uh, underground. Part of this contaminated water leaked into the, into the sea. This is a direct dis discharge. Substances released into the atmosphere will eventually fall out on land and sea. Therefore, radionuclides were brought to the sea by two ways. One from atmospheric deposition and the other from direct discharge. Release to the atmosphere was mainly in March and the direct discharge peaked up to the beginning of the April. This figure shows how cesium-137 was released to the atmosphere here throughout March. Radioactivity is indicated by petal backgrounds or 10 to the 15th background. It is reconstructed by back calculation with atmospheric direct disclosure model. And it's <clears throat> and the release rate was reconstructed fairly in detail. The estimated release correspond, corresponds well to the events such as hydrogen explosion, events, and unexplained pressure drops. Similar estimates were possible for direct discharge into the ocean. 
However, uh, the observation data is scarce in the sea, and the detailed process cannot be reconstructed. As shown in red line on the slide, the amount of discharge can be can also be calculated from the radioactivity at the harbor of the planet. Uh, the blue and green line shows the estimate by this method. The amount of cesium-137 released are shown in units of petal vapors in this slide. The amount directly discharged in Fukushima accident is estimated to be three to six petal vapors. It is, it is shown in green color in, in the bar. The amount deposited from atmosphere onto the sea is 12 to 15 petal vapors. It is shown in blue in the bar. The total amount is 18 to 27, including the amount that was that has fallen on land, which is shown in white. There is a place called Sellafield in UK where nuclear facilities, including fuel reprocessing, are gathered. The amount released from 1951 to 1992 was 41 petal It seems a lot more than Fukushima, but keep in mind that uh, this is 40 years of discharge. In Fukushima, most of the discharge occurred in, uh, in a few weeks. Much larger amount was released in a shorter period. It, in the well-known 1986 Chern Chernobyl accident, the power plant was uh, located on the continent and 15 to 20 out of the total emission of 85 <clears throat> went to the ocean via atmosphere. In the atmospheric nuclear test, 95, 950 petabacros of cesium 137 released worldwide and 600 is transferred to the ocean. Returning to Fukushima, the reactor unit one, two, three had a total of 700 petal vapors of cesium 137. Of these, 140 petal vapors went into the contaminated water beneath the power plant in April or in May. Only three to six <clears throat> of them went into the sea. This contaminated water was pumped up and reused again after treatment, and most of the cesium has, has now been re removed already. This is the last slide. The radioactive materials were brought to the sea in several different ways. In the sea, they are transported around the sea, along the seawater, and some went into the bottom sediment as shown in the screen. They are also transferred to marine organisms. The panelists after this will talk about this, these processes. That's all for my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kanda. Appreciate uh, your efforts to get this data. It really means a lot, obviously. We have a question from the audience, which is quite pertinent. Uh, we heard about an ice wall built to prevent the movement of radioactive water into the ocean. How well did the ice wall work? Well, <clears throat> the ice wall <clears throat> has uh, two purposes. One is preventing radionuclides uh, migration into the sea. And also it, it is used for preventing inflow of groundwater into the basement of the uh, power plant. So the ice wall is, has some success in preventing the uh, groundwater. However, uh, mm. in case of uh, preventing radionuclides migration into the sea, the effect is controversial, I think. Tell me a little bit, um, big picture about your work. Uh, it, in a sense, uh, looking at it a little bit half full here, it does provide an opportunity for researchers to understand how radionuclides pass through our environment. Uh, in a sense, it's a laboratory you would never hope to create. Tell me um, how uh, it provided some opportunities for science. Well, tracking radionuclides from, from the accident has deepened our understanding of the material cycle system that connects land, river, groundwater, and the sea. 
And also, uh, in the ocean, several unknown <clears throat> or uh, unexplained, uh, I'm sorry, uh, several pathways of uh, seawater flow were expected, but never has been proved. But in tracking the radionuclides, we knew uh, the pathway. For example, uh, there is a subsurface flow of water from north to south around, around 300 meters or 500 meters below the surface, and subsequently we return to the uh, Sea of Japan. This kind of uh, yes, <clears throat> flow of seawater was proved. Uh, this is the work of uh, Professor Aoyama and that's his colleagues. But this kind of uh, a lot of scientific results are obtained from talking to the radionuclides from Fukushima. All right, Professor Kondo, we'll have some more questions for you in the panel section, and we invite our audience to continue sending us questions, which we will address uh, as we go, and in particular at the end of our session. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Kondo. We'll see you in just a few minutes. Thank you very much. Our next scientific presenter was also in the waters off Fukushima not long after the meltdowns, trying to get some data. He has followed the cesium-137 and other radionuclides ever since. You know, reporters often say, always follow the money. Ken Bissler always follows the cesium. He cut his teeth doing research on the impacts of atmospheric weapons testing and the Chernobyl meltdown. He's been a strong advocate for gathering the essential data researchers need to understand the spread of radionuclides and their potential impact. In fact, when the US government showed no interest in doing it, he recruited an army of volunteers <clears throat> to gather samples on the west coast of the US. 10 years later, he has a very clear picture of how the cesium flows and among other things, some rivers run through it. Please welcome Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution senior scientist, Ken Bissler. Well, thank you, Miles, for that introduction. My name is Ken Bissler. I'm a senior scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And I'm very pleased to be talking today about the fate and consequences of radioactivity from Fukushima Daiichi as it entered the ocean in 2011 and over the last 10 years. Very briefly, the outline I hope to take you through in this short period of time is a discussion of radioactivity in the ocean and seawater and how it moves, radioactivity as it reaches the seafloor, talk a bit about ongoing sources from land like rivers and groundwater, and end with a short discussion of future concerns such as the contaminated water that still exists in thousands of tanks stored on the reactor site. So let's get right to it. Radioactivity in seawater is our first topic of discussion. And I'll be showing very few graphs, but this one's kind of important. And what it shows are the levels of a radioactive form of cesium, cesium-137 that you've heard about, in the waters as close as possible to Fukushima Daiichi here, the red dot up on the map. Each black dot here is a seawater sample. So it's the concentration of that isotope at that time running here from 2011 to 2020 in the ocean closest to the reactors. Now, the vertical axis is a logarithmic scale because we have to plot between very high levels, uh, tens of millions of becquerels per cubic meter down here to one or two. And that unit of becquerels, a very small amount of radioactivity, a cubic meter, about uh, 260 gallons of water, a big volume of water. So these numbers uh, range from very low to very high, as you'll see shortly. And the most interesting point really is that in 2011, this was an unprecedented event for the ocean. We saw extremely high levels, more than 50 million becquerels per cubic meter of this radioactive form of cesium in the ocean close to Fukushima Daiichi. Now these are the highest numbers that were found in the ocean because we're very close to that reactor site. But look at that number compared to Chernobyl, work we did in the Black Sea back in 1986. The highest numbers we saw were about 1,000 or this horizontal line here prior to the accident. And in fact, in every ocean around the world, we see one or two becquerels per cubic meter of cesium in the ocean. Now that exists because of our testing in the atmosphere of nuclear weapons that delivered fallout globally. So we always will have some cesium. And the question is how much more did this accident add? And it was certainly quite high at the beginning. 
What happened next is we saw a very rapid decrease in the month or two after the initial releases. That's because of heroic efforts at the nuclear power plant to stop that direct discharge, radioactivity entering the ocean through liquid releases at Fukushima Daiichi. In fact, around here in June is when we first arrived to take our measurements and close to the reactor, there were tens of thousands of these units. And so there was a rapid drop off. It slowed after that, and it took about four years for the cesium to reach levels of 1,000. And I'll tell you in the next slide really why that's important. But basically it started to decrease, but more slowly over the following four years. And again, each dot is a sample. So there's lots of variations around this, but that's a general trend that you see in all of these data, even at different sites. Finally, the point here is that the levels are relatively consistent these last four or five years and higher than that number of one or two that existed prior to the accident. So we know from that difference that there must be a source. And by the end of the talk, I'll talk about how large it is relative to each of these sources that we had in 2011 and today. But really, you know, Becquerel per cubic meter doesn't have a lot of meaning to most people. The question is, when should I be concerned? And so for humans, we have a few standards. One is a drinking water limit. That's 10,000 in these units. Japan got below that in the ocean very quickly, but really we don't drink the ocean water. So it's really not an appropriate standard, but it just gives you some scale that these numbers, even though they may sound alarmingly high, ended up being very quickly below, say, drinking water standards. As a scientist though, I like to put these in context of a couple of things. One is when will there be direct harm to marine life? And that's if you were a fish, say, living in an ocean greater than 1 million becquerels per cubic meter, you might see mortality and death, actually very visible effects. And we got out of that red zone within the first couple of months. We entered then for several years up till 2015, till we got to about 1,000 in the yellow zone. And that's really where we'd have concern for consumption of seafood. If you internalize cesium-137 and other forms of radioactivity, it has a greater health effect. So we're not harming marine life per se, but human consumers would be concerned. And that's why Japan correctly shut down fisheries for several years and has only recently reopened them. And you'll hear more about that from the next panelist. Today, we're more in this green zone where we really have less concern. The doses are quite small. They're not zero, but for swimming, uh, seafood levels, uh, sailing and surfing. So we're, we've kind of reached a point where we don't have the direct concern, but there still is an ongoing source that we'll talk about. So this is right at the coastline. What happens when it gets into the ocean? How quickly is it moved around? And I just love this image. It's, a, it's an animation of the ocean currents in the Pacific. You see Japan there, and you see these white squiggly lines. Those are representing these ocean currents and carrying water from Japan to the east across the Pacific. And the more white you see, the stronger those currents. This particular set of white lines is the Kurashio current. Uh, think of it as a Gulf Stream of the Pacific, very rapidly moving, transporting things away from Japan. And if you can see my little finger there, the arrow, that's the location of Fukushima Daiichi, just north of that current. So anything put into the ocean would follow that same pathway across the Pacific. So that's actually important because as it moves, the levels get lower, which is good for most isotopes, cesium being the one we've been focusing on. And we wanted to see how high those levels might be and people were concerned on the west coast of North America. So here are a series of measurements. These are not from a government lab. This is a, a work conducted by uh, citizen scientists or ships of opportunity that were going already through this region. And look here at these darker colors, the highest numbers were over eight, maybe 10 becquerels per cubic meter. So that's a very small number compared to the millions at the beginning, or even the hundred to a thousand level off of Japan. The light blue, we can't even detect the Japanese derived cesium that came across. So most of these numbers are quite low, well below health concern levels, and only obtained through some really great assistance in a program that we set up in early 2014 called Our Radioactive Ocean, where school kids, families, surfers got together, collected samples up and down the coastline and sent them back to my lab so we could do analyses and post maps like this and talk about radioactivity and what it means. So that's one way we know actually about that transport and how high the levels are. Just to give you a flavor, 
a number about 10 if you swam in the ocean every day for a year in waters that were about 10 becquerels per cubic meter. The dose, the additional exposure would be about a thousand times less than a single dental x-ray. So certainly by the time those waters reach our west uh, coast, they're quite low. Let's quickly review what happened on the seafloor. Some of that radioactivity accumulates in seafloor sediments. Those levels of cesium, now becquerels per kilogram, uh, decrease over time, about a factor of five here from March 2011 to March 2018. A lot of variability, but still a slow decrease. And that's not really because of radioactive decay, but because of mixing down of the fresh material deeper by organisms like starfish and sea urchins. So that's a somewhat slower process of a decrease than you'd see in the ocean. But that's ongoing and happens to this day. What about other sources that might be with us? Well, there are several small rivers that drain the coastline in Fukushima Prefecture. Here's a nuclear power plant, the bright red darker colors here in the bottom of the map. So what's carried by the river will reflect the amount of cesium on land from the fallout that we talked about earlier. And so the first order, the amount you'd expect in the river depends upon where the river is relative to this fallout pattern. But also important is that cesium attaches primarily to soil because of the clay and organic content. So it's really not coming down the river in the water, but associated with the particles, the river-borne particles. And these particles are more abundant after heavy rains like typhoons or in spring snow melt. So it comes down in pulses as these uh, particles are injected into the river and move their way to the ocean. And finally, the important point is cesium, though it attaches to soil particles in fresh water, so in a river, when those particles reach the ocean, there's a change in chemistry. It's more salty, and the cesium is re-released back into the ocean. So that's something that many scientists in Japan and elsewhere have been studying over time, trying to catch these input events. And so we'll compare that to groundwater, a somewhat unexpected finding. Here's an image, a photograph from Yotsukura. It's a beach about 35 kilometers or 20 miles south of Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plants. And we took several samples, from digging down, sampling the sand and the water here. These tubes are collecting groundwater below the beach sands. And that beach actually got contaminated by the ocean water flowing by in 2011. You know, levels were millions of becquerels per cubic meter. And every tidal cycle, that water moves underneath the beach and back out again. So that's the original source of cesium where we were looking. What was kind of unexpected is that the level in these water samples is certainly much higher than wells and rivers on the land side, or even the ocean on the other side. And in fact, in 2016, some of the highest levels of cesium we found were actually in these groundwaters, even higher than near Fukushima Daiichi itself. But the big question is not dangerous to stand there and sample, but is how big of a source, how much is coming from this site versus others. But we do know from that type of study that there is a source to the ocean. So here it is in a cartoon kind of form. We talked in the first panelist about the atmospheric deposition, direct discharge together about 20 peta becquerels. Peta is a very big number, one with 15 zeros, 10 to the 15th. And ongoing from the reactor, something per year, about 0.01, in those same units, petabecquerels, versus 20 in the first couple of months. The rivers have a similar number, 0.01. It's hard to sample, a lot of variability. And these groundwaters introducing, again, a similar range. We know there are three ongoing sources, groundwater, river water, and the reactor site itself. So let's finish up with our future concerns. These tanks, we know there are thousands of tanks that contain radioactive cooling waters. So these buildings were damaged groundwater and actively cooling water is pumped through them each day to keep these reactors cool, even though they're damaged. And Japan is trying to decide what to do with that radioactive contaminated water. Well, one thing that's come up and that I just wanted to talk about a little bit here on my last slide is that the cleanup of that water, while it's been ongoing for 10 years, is not 100% effective. So in 2018, only a couple of years ago, they announced not only tritium, tritium is actually a radioactive form of hydrogen, so part of water at H2O molecule would contain tritium, but many other isotopes are in those tanks still, and over 70% of the tanks would have to be cleaned up further 
before they might consider even releasing because the tritium level itself might not be of concern, but these other isotopes are of concern. Tritium is one of the least harmful in terms of its dose effects. That's why it's here on the left on this graph. But these other bars are something that oceanographers care about, which is the distribution in the ocean. How much would end up in marine life, this biological concentration factor, the light blue bars, and how much might end up associated with the seafloor sediments. And so those are quite different, and therefore we would have to be concerned about their fate in the ocean and not simply tritium as the one isotope of concern. For the future, that would imply additional cleanup that would have to be done and organized, more details on what to, in each tank, and then some sort of independent monitoring plan that should actually begin now before there are releases or be at least part of the plans for potential release of this water versus other solutions. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ken, and we appreciate all your efforts to keep the data flowing as you watch the flow of the cesium and other things. Um, Niels asks an interesting question. Was the change in concentrations of cesium in the ocean mainly due to dilution and settling on the seafloor, or were there other chemical processes at work? It's, well, as I showed in what I tried to show the ocean currents, cesium is largely soluble. That means that if you put it through a filter, 99% goes through that filter and moves with those currents away from the coast and are diluted. There's a small percentage we saw that in the sediment core, some cesium, that's really a small fraction. So the two processes that really affect it are its transport with water, the dominant one, and then uptake on the seafloor. And quantitatively, there's also uptake in sea life. And that's what our next speaker is going to talk about as well. Yuko has a question. Uh, has the Japanese government taken an interest in levels of radioactivity in the beach sands and the seafloor sediment? Uh, absolutely, in terms of the seafloor was sampled right from the beginning. Uh, the beaches and the groundwater, there was a bit of a surprise to us. Uh, I work with some really interesting scientists study groundwater, Matt Charette, his postdoc, Virginie Sonal, and they started going up and down the coastline uh, getting surprised by the levels in that water right below the sands on the beaches. And it took us a few years to figure out really what was going on that most likely, and I think almost certainly that the water, because it was so high in 2011, the beaches acted like a sponge. So they would accumulate some of that radioactivity and then slowly release it back to the ocean. And so what uh, the surprise was there, and I don't think enough work has been done uh, I had intended to go this year, COVID kept me at home most of the time in this room, but uh, we want to go back and try and quantify how much is coming off of those beaches, variations within different beaches and those processes. We've done laboratory experiments. So I think that's one of the big surprises and something worth following up on. And just to continue, if I may, you know, that source, as I tried to show with the arrows, is as large as the rivers, as large as the reactors. So whatever we do at the reactor site, we have to consider these other sources in terms of long-term predictions, what's going to happen, when will the levels drop back to where they were before? I think we all wish we were doing this in Japan, don't we, Ken? Uh, <laughs> from the audience, uh, a quick one, I, but worth, you know, we take some things for granted. Is there any way to shorten the half-life of cesium or other radioactive isotopes? No, I mean, those are the fundamental physical properties of time it takes for these unstable atoms to break apart. In fact, as a radiochemist, we use them as clocks. They tell us how fast, say, things are buried uh, in the seafloor, those ocean currents. And in 2011, a second form of cesium-134 had a shorter half-life by its nature, two years. And so using two isotopes, we could fingerprint and tell, did that cesium come from Fukushima Daiichi, or was it there already? So we use that actually as a way to tell us about time scales and to fingerprint what the source is of the different radioactive contaminants. Thank you for the brief Physics 101, Dr. Bissler, <laughs> and uh, you stand by. We'll be back with you in just a few minutes, and we'll get a uh, many more questions in from the audience uh, for you. Uh, so um, what do we know about radionuclides and how they affect the marine organisms? Ultimately, that's the most important question, right? It's a question many sushi lovers have asked subsequent to the meltdowns. 
it's not a simple question to answer. It depends on where the regulatory levels are set and where the fish might be swimming in the sea, among other things. And it's a question that has a huge impact on an important industry in Japan. Convincing people that it's okay to eat seafood that comes from Fukushima waters remains a big challenge. Our next speaker is a radio ecologist who focuses her work in this direction at France's Institute of Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety. Please welcome Sabine Charmasson. Thank you, Miles, and thank you, everybody, for joining the webinar. I am pleased to be here today to introduce you to the subject of marine biota and radioactivity. During my talk, I will first present the way biota uptake radionuclide, then deal with the situation in Fukushima, and say some words about the future needs. As it has been shown in the previous talk, radionuclide that has been released into the ocean can be formed either under dissolved or particulate form. Both can be obtained by, by all marine organisms that live either in the water column or on the bottom. The uptake of radionuclide by biota involves the different uh, processes, such as absorption processes with adsorption onto the skin or adsorption across the skin when radionuclides are incorporated into the body. Marine organisms can be contaminated also during ingestion, ingestion of seawater, food, and sediment for those organisms that live close to the bottom. And they eliminate radionuclide by excretion processes that, that take place into gills or digestive system. Elimination and accumulation parameters are determined during uh, laboratory experiments. When an organism is placed into a contaminated environment, the concentration of this of uh, the radionuclides slowly increase in its body. At the beginning, uptake dominates, leading to fast accumulation of radionuclide, but gradually excretion takes place and the curve reaches a plateau when a dynamic equilibrium is reached. It means that uptake rate equal the excretion rate. There is then no more increase in concentration over time. And this value here is a concentration factor at steady state. So, so, so concentration factors allow to know how much radionuclide a given organism can accumulate. And if it's greater than one, it means that there is bio accumulation. When the same organism is placed in two clean environment, its radionuclide concentrations progressively decrease, allowing to determine expression parameters and to, def to determine the biological half-life. Biological half-life is the duration, it's the time required by an organism to lower by half its radionuclide body burden. This is an example of bioaccumulation experiments made on uh, shrimp and uh, algae with radiocesium. And you see that here with the shrimp, you have a nice plateau with a trich and you have the value of the concentration factor. And for algae, we have uh, to extrapolate until the, the value of 15 is reached. For fish, the average uh, concentration factor is around the 100 even if there can be some uh, variation between species, this gives the order of magnitude. This is an example of plutonium. Uh, plutonium uh, behaves uh, uh, really differently compared to cesium. And uh, as you see, you can have CF less than one for fish with intermediate value for invertebrates and very high value for plankton. So even if we don't eat phytoplankton or zooplankton, it should be kept in mind that they are the basis of the food chain. They are eaten by planktivorous fish, which in turn are eaten by carnivorous fish and so on. So concentration factors are parameters that are useful for radioecologists because they allow to compare, to compare the relative bioavailability of different radionuclides to a given organisms. And in the same way, they allow also to compare ability of different organisms to accumulate a given radionuclide. 
as you have seen, uh, accumulation rates can vary depending on species and depending on the element. And this is exactly the same for uh, alpha. This slide gives an idea about how long it takes for radionuclide to cycle through fish. Cesium, which has been released in large quantity in, in, during the Fukushima accident, is uh, behave like potassium. So it goes mainly in muscles and organs, and it cycles through the body in terms of weeks or even months. If we take now into account uh, other radionuclides that have been released by Fukushima, you have tritium. Tritium is hydrogen, so it cycles within fish in terms of days, while strontium behaves like calcium. So is, it is taken up by in bones and it cycles in through the body in terms of years. So what was the situation in Fukushima? After the powerful earthquake and tsunami, many fishing boats were destroyed and due to the releases of radionuclide in the environment, fisheries were banned from March 15th. Professional standards for consumer protection were established uh, first based on international standards. They were adapted to the Japanese uh, population and lowered down to 100 becquerel per kilo for radiocesium. Extensive monitoring survey has been set up uh, from the end of March 2011. And thousands of fish have been measured each uh, quarter, and the quarter is represented by a bar. The blue bar represents the fish that were below uh, the Japanese limit of 100 becquerel per kilo. When uh, the orange rectangle and the red number show the fish that were above this limit. You can notice that from 2015, there were almost no fish above this limit, except in late 2018, and recently, so it is not shown on this figure, last week also what's one other sample was found to be above this limit. In these two cases, these fish were fish living close to the bottom, and they were caught off the coast of uh, the Fukushima prefecture. This slide is also representing some data about the monitoring survey, but they are presented prefecture by prefecture. And it concerns uh, demersal fish, that means fish that live in close connection with the bottom. Three striking features here. The highest uh, contamination is found in off the Fukushima prefecture, which is expected. And the levels were quite high for the two first uh, year. And for a given date, there is a very uh, large range of, of uh, radionuclide concentration. This is partly due to the fact that we have mixed here several species. And as I showed you before, accumulation and elimination rates can vary depending on the species. And this is why the fishery management has been carried out species by species. But even for one species, for a given species, we can have difference between male and female depending on the size of its adults and juveniles. This slide shows uh, data from a survey carried out by MAF and TEPCO concerning fish living in the water column of the mackerel family and the fat greening, which is a fish living close to the bottom. Here again, you have very high level over the two first years and then the decrease over time. It appears, it seems that with, with time, we have less and less sample, but in fact, it's mainly due to the fact that the contamination of the environment is decreasing. And so you have more and more samples that are under the detection limit and they are now represented here. But the main thing here is that the bottom fish living is presenting higher uh, level of uh, cesium compared to the fish living in the water column. And this is because these fish feed on prey living uh, on or inside contaminated sediment. It has been shown also that some species show very low metabolic rate. That is to say they have long depuration rates, so very long biological half-life. Uh, details of this kind of study can be found in the poster session. So what are the future needs? For bio species, season levels are still higher than they were before they were before the accident. And this has been shown in the previous talk 
are still continuous inputs from the from the side the rivers and the groundwaters. But this mainly concerns species that live uh, close to the bottom due to the fact that the contamination of the sediment lasts for long. Survey sure must be maintained, but as level are decreasing, the detection limit should be lowered. And it might be better to have less sample but higher precision. And uh, I think this is an example of how studies carried out in the frame of expertise of control can feed the research field. And indeed, a huge amount of data were collected uh, since the accident, and they deserve to be looked at carefully to improve knowledge. But for this to be achieved, we need more information about fish size, if it's male, female, exact locations. Fortunately, there are not many uh, sites like uh, the Fukushima site uh, in the world, and I should even say that this situation is unique regarding the marine environment. So in-depth feedback on the impact of radioactive releases on marine ecosystem and biota especially uh, is desirable and, uh, and necessary. Uh, as you have seen uh, in the previous talk, the situation on the site remains fragile and uh, it is necessary to stay on the alert in case of any new releases. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that talk. Um, we have a question from a commercial fisherman in Santa Barbara. And he asks if radiation from Fukushima could be high enough to be the cause of the loss of kelp beds that he's seeing, or if it could affect fisheries elsewhere in the world. Uh as it has been underlined by Ken Bussler during his talk, uh, during the first 30 days, marine life close to the power plant and which, which stay there, that is to say, for example, the benthic invertebrates have received high doses that can lead to marked reproduc reproductive uh, effect and even mortality, but it's really local and, cl and clearly close to the, to the releases. And uh, I don't see don't, I can't imagine any effect at the long range on the other side of the Pacific. And uh, I don't think, and really due to the, what we know now about the Fukushima area, there is no effect at the global uh, scale, like uh, at the population level or, or at large scale uh, or at large Pascal spatial scale. So no, I, I really, I don't see any effect on, on this. It must might be, be something else. Yeah, something else. Uh, Michael asks, what is the threat to humans from bioaccumulation in apex predators like tuna or to marine mammals like whales? In fact, um, radionuclides do, do not really biomagnify in, in food, married food chain. Only cesium can, we can find some biomagnification of cesium in some marine food chain, and it's mainly linked to change in trophic regime. So uh, there is no increase like, for example, uh, DTT or, or mercury in, in, in the top predators uh, when we speak about uh, radionuclides. So there is no increase along the food chain in, in, in the Radron Kai that was released in, in, in Fukushima. Rona asks, what happens to the radioactive materials in fish when they die? It's like the organic matter, all is recycled. It's taken up by other uh, animals in the sea. They can be uh, uh, carnivores or detritivores, that means that uh, organisms that eat uh, dead, uh, dead bodies and uh, all is recycled and the uh, radium clients do the same. Final thought before we uh, move on to our next panelist. Um, what do you think it will take for people to regain confidence in seafood from Fukushima? I should say con to continue monitoring and gathering data about what you in fish for sure and seafood in general. 
and uh, find a way to make the information available to the public uh, in order to, in, with transparency and pedagogy? Sabine, Sabine Charmasson, thank you so much. Stand by, we'll have some more questions for you momentarily. That sure. issue of public confidence and transparency leads us well to our next panelist. Uh, he has worked long and hard to employ candor and transparency as a way to earn the trust of the public. Unfortunately, not everyone sees the wisdom of that. From the outset, the Japanese government and TEPCO stonewalled the release of information about the meltdowns, and that has persisted until today as it pushes to release tainted water from all those tanks. The truth is they really haven't learned their lesson. On 3.11, trust in the nuclear industry melted down as well. Our panelist is a leader of a grassroots organization that began immediately in the wake of the meltdowns. SafeCast has empowered people in Japan and all over the world now to become their own data collectors and truth tellers. Please welcome Asby Brown. Thank you, Miles. And uh, thanks to everyone who's tuned in for this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here. My name is Asby Brown. I'm the lead researcher for SafeCast. And today I'm going to talk about Fukushima as a crisis of trust. Uh, basically, I will talk about information and transparency, misinformation, disinformation, social information needs, and trust. And I want to start with this key question, which is, uh, despite the clear conclusions from the scientific data, many people do not believe that Fukushima marine products are safe to eat. And why not? And there are a lot of reasons. Uh, I want to point out that in times of crisis, people seek answers, but often find a lack of clarity. And this is really, I think, at the root of a lot of the fundamental trust issues. So uh, let's look at a few things that we at SafeCast saw after Fukushima regarding information. Uh, you know, we were looking for maps of radiation spread to find out where's the radiation, what are the risks to us, and often, uh, especially in the first weeks and months, information was very unclear, like this map is from uh, MEXT, Japanese agency, uh, released in March 17th, 2011, and it is basically illegible to, to uh, uh, normal people, uh, hard to figure out what this is saying. Uh, often information was gathered but not publicized. Uh, this is an example of uh, aerial reconnaissance, uh, you know, radiation monitoring data uh, done by the U.S. DOE and NSA, uh, really in the week after the disaster began in March uh, 2011. Uh, and under the agreement between the U.S. and the Japanese government, the Japanese government would be allowed to decide how and when to publicize it, but they never did. And what ultimately happened was that the DOE uh, put this on their website quietly, and uh, Japanese journalists found it and then published it in the Asahi newspaper uh, a week or so later. And this was shocking to people that this, uh, this shows that the radiation had spread beyond the 20 kilometer uh, evacuation zone uh, into the town of Itate in particular. And it was rather shocking when people found out that this information had not been uh, made public. Uh, a lot of information was delayed, sometimes uh, by months. Uh, the first maps that showed radiation uh, situation in the Tokyo area was not released until October 2011. Now, by that time, many people knew already that there had been fallout, particularly in the Chiba area. Uh, lots of uh, people were sharing information on social media, but there were no official maps until October of this. So this is really re very, very delayed. Uh, often information was uh, obscured. This is a map from NHK television in April, late April of 2011, uh, showing sort of handwritten Sharpie marks of various cities uh, north of Tokyo, uh, what the radiation levels were in a fairly unrepresentative way. But the key point is that Fukushima itself is covered up on this map. Uh, there is no information on this broadcast about what the radiation was like in Fukushima. So you say, why is this being obscured? Uh, all these things really damage trust uh, and leave people with anxiety and, and with this lack of clarity. Um, another example is uh, monitoring data for foodstuffs. And uh, the Japanese government did a pretty good job of setting up testing uh, and did a thorough job. And I think they deserve credit as do the producers. Uh, but often the data was just too complex for average people to understand. And this is an example of a testing uh, data sheet, uh, one of 34 that was uh, available on uh, August 10th in 2012, so a year later. Uh, and it's just too complex. We could not figure out, is the radiation increasing in the fish? Is it decreasing? Are some species increasing and others are 
decreasing? Does it depend on where they're caught? Uh, this was just uh, very difficult to, to make sense of. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Bessler uh, published a paper in Science uh, in October of 2012, which just clarified this beautifully by dividing the species according to their environmental niche. So the, the surface dwellers, the, the pelagic fish, the migratory species, the bottom dwellers, et cetera. And what it showed was that it, the radiation levels were decreasing in almost all species except for the bottom dwellers. This was very useful data for everybody to know. Basically, avoid the flounder. This was very, very important. And we question why didn't the Japanese government themselves make that kind of uh, information available? Another big problem that damaged trust was the, this incredible amount of misinformation and disinformation that emerged, uh, partly because of this vacuum of information uh, from the government. And uh, disinformation and misinformation are a little bit different. Misinformation can be sort of sincere mistakes or just not understanding and spreading information, rumors that you hear without any malicious intent, where this disinformation is often intentional uh, propaganda. People do it for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one example is this map that spread uh, widely after the disaster, uh, purportedly showing uh, radiation levels in the Pacific Ocean, these shocking colors. Uh, but in fact, that's not what this is. This is a map showing the height of the tsunami. Uh, but this spread and was misrepresented by all sorts of media sources and, and lots of individuals, etc., uh, along with claims that the Pacific Ocean had died because of Fukushima radiation. And as we know from earlier presentations, the radiation levels were very high initially, uh, close to Japan, close to Fukushima. But gradually, as they spread throughout the Pacific, they were higher than normal but really not at that dangerous level. Uh, but these things spread a lot. Of course, this was simply not true. Uh, we debunked it, others debunked it, but we have to point out that even if you debunk something, it doesn't stay debunked. And these, the same map, the same images, the same claims about the die-off in the Pacific continue to, to spread uh, in social media. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why misinformation and disinformation can be so sticky and so persistent uh, and, and, and how it can take root. And one is uh, that uh, basically the public lacks media literacy. Uh, and, and I think we should actually teach this in schools, how to determine what sort of information sources are going to be more reliable, but we don't. Uh, there's an, an emotional component. They, uh, these sort of misinformation and disinformation play on people's fears, on their anger, uh, and this gets people to engage with it more. There's a big social component that we, we're more likely to trust things we hear from family and friends or people that we like or people that sort of share our identity. And finally, the people who spread uh, disinformation and sp specifically are often very highly motivated. They may be doing it for money. They may be doing it for political reasons. They may be doing it for some other agenda, sometimes just for yucks, but they're very, very motivated. That is, they have more energy to spread it than the rest of us do to debunk it. Uh, the key point, though, is that acceptance of disinformation makes it difficult for people to work together. And we see have seen this uh, later in other cases, uh, certainly with coronavirus uh, and, and even with election issues in the United States. Uh, in crises, the scientific and technical need for information is often recognized, but the social need is not. And this is very important. No matter how good the science is, if you don't think about who it's for, how they're likely to react, uh, how they're going to find this information, uh, th then the information may miss the target. And one example is that the allowable limit for radiation in food uh, in Japan was lowered from 500 becquerels per kilogram to 100 becquerels per kilogram in April of 2012. This this should be a good thing that it means that the, the uh, regulations are stricter, but the reaction to from the public was some people just questioning, oh, so it's safer now? Others would say, oh, that means if it's easier to exceed the level, then more food will be unsafe, right? And other people would say, wait, what do you mean? You had to change the limit because it wasn't safe enough? So there's a lot of misunderstanding about that, and, and this uh, sort of thing needs to have a lot of care taken before these policies are rolled out. Uh, another kind of instance that points out a lot of problems is uh, the, the water Water, the contaminated water uh, that has been treated at Fukushima Daiichi and plans are to release it, uh, dilute it and release it to the ocean. And there's a strong consensus among the agencies and scientists that this would be the least objectionable uh, way to deal with it. Uh, but it needs public support and there's a lot of public opposition. Uh, for years, TEPCO claimed that there was only tritium. Only uh, tritium is of concern. Everything else has been dealt with. But in October 2018, they admitted that there were a lot of other radionuclides that exceeded the release limits, including strontium-90, cobalt-60, etc. And of course, the result was outrage from the public, uh, more damage uh, you know, in trust of TEPCO and government, and the opposition to this release is strengthened. Uh, so this you know, is a huge backfire. And, and because 
because of the lack of transparency all along, it set up the situation for this to happen. There's lots of other information problems after 9-11. The data can be obscure in that we just can't find it. It can be incomplete. You have information of, of one town, for instance, but you don't have the information of the town next to it. Uh, it can be uninclusive, meaning it's not intended for the public anyway. It's for experts or, or government itself. So it's, it's kind of hard to understand. A lot of things disappeared from the web uh, for one reason or another. Links broke or disappeared. Uh, and sometimes it's just too complex. You need more scientific literacy to deal with it, or it can be a noisy information environment with lots of competing uh, voices, lots of contradictions, lots of claims, etc. So uh, all these things played out uh, after Fukushima and caused a lot of problems. And a lot of uh, them were recognized and understood by the emergency response communities. Uh, and for years, there have been uh, you know conferences and workshops to deal with this and to make sure this doesn't happen again. But in 2020, uh, when coronavirus emerged, we just all had deja vu because a lot of the same problems continued to reoccur in many countries. Certainly they happened in Japan, certainly in the United States. Some countries dealt with it better. Uh, we were asked by the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists to uh, write a paper about um, how our experience at Fukushima helped us understand what was going on in terms of information with coronavirus and, and uh, to lead us to, to propose some uh, recommendations about how, to, how governments should be dealing with information. Uh, and again, it's a year later, and a lot of the problems have not yet been solved. Um, again, the key issue is trust. And we like to point out that trust is not a renewable resource. In other words, once you lose it, you may never get it back. Uh, you have to be careful not to lose it in the first place. Uh, and the other thing is that trust requires transparency. There can be no trust without transparency. It's essential that it's very clear and unambiguous and transparent. Uh, and often this is where things fall down. Uh, uh, scientists themselves are often the most transparent uh, institutionally in the world. Uh, but when this gets into the hands of, of people who have to promote the information to the public, such as government or media, uh, this is where problems often occur. Finally, I just wanna point out that things fail for a lot of reasons. It's not often uh, malicious. It's often just mistakes. Uh, we have to understand that it's never going to be perfect, but we have to anticipate the potential failure points and how things can be misunderstood, how the messages can miss the mark and lead to issues of trust that still are causing people to avoid uh, eating Fukushima fish and other marine products uh, and with this continuing damage to the market and reputation of the fisheries, which we think are demonstrably safe. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can uh, check out the webcast, uh, the, uh, the website of Safecast uh, at safecast.org, and uh, uh, happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Asby. Appreciate that excellent talk. Um, good question from the audience. Uh, Amy asks, uh, uh, excuse me, David asks, is the testing regime established by Japan accurate and trustworthy? That's a really reasonable question to ask. Uh, I have more and more confidence after the first uh, two or three years looking at the data, examining it, that it was being well done, even if it wasn't being well communicated. But I would also stress that I would have much less confidence in it if there had not also been a lot of independent testing being done by citizen labs, by, by other groups uh, in Fukushima and elsewhere that could act as a check on the accuracy and the plausibility of the data. So I think having this uh, reality check from uh, citizens and individuals themselves was important in establishing that the other testing data was actually uh, pretty good. And at this moment, I'm going to encourage our other panelists to turn their cameras and their microphones on because I'm going to bring you in here for the full panel discussion here shortly. But one more for Asby. Uh, the question is, um, uh, the uh, uh, excuse me, it, it moved and I lost my place. Oh, I Joanne asked, I remember the Japanese citizens wore bento Geiger counters, might have been safe cast devices, in the markets. It, give, a, give us an update on the efforts by Japanese citizens, perhaps with encouragement by SafeCast, to monitor current radiation levels. Yes, there's quite a lot still going on. And yeah, the bento Geiger counter, that is the B-Geige uh, invented by SafeCast and made available 
to people all over the world. Uh, it was a very successful device, uh, still in use, that has built-in GPS data logging, allows anybody to carry it around, uh, put it on their car, their bicycle, and map radiation data. And this allowed us to gather, uh, initially in 2011, 2012, probably more data than the Japanese government was gathering. And now it's the largest independent data set of radiation uh, data anywhere. Uh, but not just SafeCast, there's a lot of groups in Fukushima who also have parallel projects to monitor their towns. Uh, difference being SafeCast is really a global project. We were thinking from the beginning of uh, the response by the global community, the need to, to tell, help people understand around the world what was going on. The communities that we see in, uh, in Fukushima, for instance, are much more local, which is a very strong thing. They're, they're working with their neighbors to, to see what's happening in their town. Uh, there's quite a lot. It's still going on. Uh, as time goes on, maybe some become less active, but it's a very, very vital activity. And the, the participation in this kind of thing uh, has a lot of benefits, both for society and for individuals. It helps you stay busy to, to uh, know that you're taking uh, some efforts to, to understand your situation and control it. And it also um, provides information and data that people can use to bring to their governments and say, hey, you know, you have to clean up this park or you have to take better care of this street. So it's a very, very important thing. And participation is, is also a great way of educating people. So um, it's all going on. It's been 10 years and we're all amazed that uh, it's still going as strong as it is. It's a great story. Sia Kiona asks this, why, and this, this could be a long one, but uh, <laughs> try to give us a short answer. Why did the Japanese hold back the information? There's a lot of reasons. I'd say one is uh, confusion and the fact that they were not prepared. I, I would say the underlying root cause of everything was a lack of preparation because uh, they, they didn't, it was official policy that uh, disasters were impossible. A nuclear meltdown was impossible. So they didn't prepare for that. They didn't think what kind of information would need to be gathered and how it needed to be spread. So they were just caught with their pants down. Add to that the sort of uh, endemic uh, tendency in bureaucracies, not just in Japan, but elsewhere, to sort of uh, circle the wagons and, and, and cover things up. To, to avoid looking bad. In the effort to avoid looking bad, they sat on information, which ultimately became public and made them look even worse. So it's a combination of factors, but incompetence and lack of capacity are big ones. And then sort of institutional bad habits are another one. Talk about backfiring for sure. Uh, Professor Kanda, let's go back to you as we begin our uh, full panel discussion here. Um, here's a question that we don't talk too much about 10 years later. Uh, as bad as the situation was days after the tsunami, what prevented it from possibly being even worse? Well, <clears throat> certainly, it, it is certainly true that the accident could be much uh, worse one. Uh, they have successfully uh, injected water somehow, even after the hydrogen explosion. and. If that has not succeeded, the uh, situation was much more uh, bad. Uh, however, uh, yes, but the, they could have been much more re well prepared, but the, uh, however, they certainly did some job, a great job. I, I'm not, I'm, it may be controversial, it was great or not, but the, uh, they did some job, I think. Well, I do think the uh, efforts of the plant workers uh, was nothing less than heroic. They were, they were dealt a, a hand that was almost impossible. And the things right. they did at great sacrifice, uh, it's hard to overstate uh, their heroism. They, they, they won't accept that mantle, but we should give it to them. You're right, um, I, agree, I agree with that. Um, Ken, there's an awful lot of questions about the tanks, as there always are. This is the story which will probably never go away as we talk about Fukushima and its aftermath. Um, Robert has this, is the plan to slowly release the contaminated water from the thousands of storage tanks viable in terms of the degree of subsequent contamination that would result? Rebecca, with a related, what are the options available for getting rid of the contaminated water. You touched on this in your um, talk, Ken, but give us some more details here of what, you know, what the options are 
uh, you know, so I've always thought of it as kind of the sorcerer's apprentice, you know, there's just bucket after bucket, tank after tank. Can they continue that indefinitely? And is that maybe the best course of action? We just had an earthquake uh, just a few weeks ago last month in that region, in the, in the mid sevens. And you can imagine what a scenario that might be if an earthquake ruptured numerous uh, quantities of water uh, in those tanks. So what, what's the best way to proceed here? Yeah, Miles, I, I think of that sources apprentice too. I mean, you can't continually keep collecting the water. Uh, this, by the way, it's, the buildings were damaged. So a lot of this is groundwater that flows in each day that has to be, and it comes in contact with the cores and the cooling waters it becomes contaminated. So there is a big onsite effort from the start to get rid of that radioactivity. But tritium, that form of radioactive hydrogen is very difficult to remove. So now you have over time, a thousand tanks, 1.2 million tons of this water. We knew from the start, it wouldn't just be tritium though, because any way you purify uh, any contaminant, there's always a residual amount left. And because the levels were so high, we kept wanting to know what, what else is in the tanks. And I think what I've seen is a problem as we alludes to in some of this transparency is for the longest time and still today, they only talk about tritium, a relatively low on the scale of harm per dose per unit radioactivity, uh, mixes and moves quickly with the water and goes through the fish as the beam showed us. But it took seven years before they started to release data on what else is in the tanks. Now those isotopes, if they were released today, are one more dangerous in terms of their health effects. Two, they would end up more likely on the seafloor. They wouldn't mix away and dilute. So that's a, a factor. And three, they end up in marine life and fish to a much higher degree. Uh, 100 times, 300, 500 times higher, more likely than tritium to be in the seafood that we're concerned about. So, you know, a little transparency would have gone a long way to make us accept and build a solution around not just tritium, but the other isotopes. And now we're hearing a lot about, well, we can't just store forever, there's no space. Well, you have a map behind you, there's Greenland around the boundaries we're not going to quickly be building schools and factories and homes there. I think if they were a little more uh, open to considering storage, uh, well, we did, you talked about decades for cleanup. If you go out about 50, 60 years, 97% of the tritium is gone because of its 12 year half-life, it decays away. Now that might not be the best solution. We have to build stable tanks for earthquakes and things, as you mentioned, but that's, that's done in other industries. That's done in Japan for petroleum. So I think, you know, let's reconsider all of our options. Let's be honest about what's in those tanks. If the claim is they will be cleaned up further, the 70, 80% of those tanks that need further cleanup, start that today, get those numbers, and then let's talk about it. So I guess, you know, we're not there yet to make a decision. I think we should uh, consider other options in the meantime, and really be worried about the effect that might have on local fisheries, whether it's harmful or not, whether it's only tritium at small amounts that get eventually released. We have to be concerned about the impact on fisheries. Can I just jump in for a moment? You may go, Asby. Uh, and Dr. Besser and I can, you know, we've been talking about this for years, the, the need, the importance uh, for both scientific reasons and social information reasons to have third-party verification of what's in those tanks. Uh, and I know Dr. Bessler has tried to find out how to get access to that water to test it. I've asked TEPCO, I've asked in the government, would you make this available to independent researchers to verify and study? And it was never a, a clear reason given why not, but the answer was always no. And uh, this is a, a huge problem, I think. They have to understand that they need to make this accessible to researchers like Dr. Best, like Dr. Kanda and others, so they can confirm what's in there. So they can monitor how it's being released. They can see what's happening in the ocean, et cetera, afterward. Uh, this is essential, but there seemed to be no understanding of the need of that. Here's a question, question for uh, Professor Charmasson. Um, Amy asked this, how are the safety standards for radioisotopes in food sources determined? Where you draw the line is, uh, and as be referred to this, it, it can be interpreted in several ways and can lead to, a, we'll put it this way. 
when we're talking about all the units of measurement when it, come to it comes to radioactive activity, activity, I should say, it is very um, dizzying to the lay person anyway. So uh, there's not a lot of explanation what the numbers mean. People default to saying, well, I want zero. But how are the numbers arrived at in the first place, uh, Professor Charmasson? Uh, you are muted, please, if you'll hit your button there. Sorry, there sorry. Yeah. Excuse me. So I have just to say some words. Uh, when you ingest a radionuclide, uh, there is energy that is absorbed in the tissue, and this gives a dose. And it is a dose that, that matters. And when um, the international organization have set up a number, which is uh, one millisievert per year for the protection of the public, and to reach this, uh, we have to take into account how much food you eat. And for each region, for any radionuclide, there is what we call the dose conversion factor, which gives you a sievert per becquerel, which is ingested. And taking in account, into account the consumption of food and the, the, the radionuclide, you, give, you, you, have a, you can have a limit uh, in the food that you, you can eat. And this, it is this kind of, um, of estimation that has been made for, for, the, for the Japanese population who eat a, a lot of fish. And they, they decided to have a very, a very safe number because 100 becquerel is very low compared to other international standards. And uh, I think it was also to reinforce uh, confidence in their domestic supply. So it's always difficult to, to have a, a given number. Of course, zero would be perfect, but zero doesn't exist. You have also natural radioactivity. But this, this number I give for the one millisievert per year and for the, the calculation of the estimation of the limit is really nothing to do with the natural radioactivity. It's only for artificial radionuclide. Here's a question. I want to begin with uh, Professor Kanda on this, and, and we'll shift over to ASBE probably a little bit as well. What is the public policy direction for modern energy production since Fukushima? Uh, remembering the reports of the surge of anti-nuclear protests in the aftermath, I'm curious how Japan feels 10 years later. Uh, Professor Kanda, I've seen some polling where people are still at least 60% against nuclear power in Japan. Um, that, that's a fairly persistent number. Uh, are, are things changing at all 10 years later? Uh, not really. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you're certainly right. And most or many of Japanese are against nuclear power. It, it is true. However, uh, the government and the industry are seeking to continue uh, I mean, the betting on nuclear power plant, partly because uh, we are forced to cut down carbon dioxide emission from international pressure is so high because Japan, Japan is uh, producing energy uh, from fossil fuel so much after the Fukushima accident. And uh, they're doing, they're now in introducing very uh, severe standards for nuclear power plant operation, and only a couple of reactors are allowed to uh, restart. Most of them are still shut down. And uh, <clears throat> yes, it is very controversial. Uh, and we have to think about many aspects. And uh, yes, uh, we Possibly we can get rid of a nuclear power plant by using renewable energy. However, uh, several uh, researchers worked very hard for looking for the uh, suitable renewable energy around the Japanese islands. However, uh, you know, wind generators or tidal uh, generate tidal power generation are still not uh, enough. Sort of not enough in our country. This is. Um, the, the situation is very complex, I think. As B. Akira asks uh, and points out uh, about the release of a movie, Fukushima 50, uh, and of course the anniversary coming up. 
uh, how would you, you know, these are tough questions. They always ask reporters this, what's the mood there? You know, who knows what the mood is, right? What's my mood? I don't know. What, but if you could make a sweeping generalization, what's, what is the feeling in Japan 10 years post Fukushima? Uh, yes, complex. Uh, for people living in Fukushima, it's really a, a landmark. It's a time to reflect and, and to think about, you know, how much has been accomplished and what has not been accomplished. Uh, the people who have returned um, or, or never really left uh, are looking at how they're going to continue living there and making viable communities. Uh, there's a lot of forward thinking people and a fair amount of optimism among people there, even though it's a pretty difficult place to live in, in a lot of the prefecture. Um, on the other hand, most of the country seemed to have pretty much put Fukushima behind itself, uh, even years ago. Uh, it never really loomed as large in the consciousness of people further south in the Tokyo area or in the Osaka areas further to the south and to the west. Um, they really, it was easier for them to just forget about it. And I think uh, this 10th anniversary, uh, of course, will remind people and um, not just the Fukushima disaster, but also the tsunami uh, about the great trauma and the great uh, damage that happened. Um, I guess people don't really feel in terms of energy policy that they can really affect it directly, that the decisions are being made, you know, regardless of what they really think, even if they oppose nuclear energy, um, the decisions will be made. At the same time, there is a great, um, you know, resurgence or, or, or new energy uh, sources being uh, developed uh, throughout the country and, and Fukushima as well. Fukushima Prefecture announced that it would be totally um, renewable energy uh, by 2030. And if you go, you'll see solar panel fields all over uh, the, the prefecture on, on, on agricultural fields that can't be used for production economically and, and huge wind farms and other things. So there, there is a change and people are moving forward uh, and sometimes thinking that government is not necessarily responsive to uh, their desires. It's tough when you've made such a huge investment in nuclear. They have 54 reactors at the time of the accident with plans to do much more. Uh, it's difficult to turn that kind of investment around and sort of walk away from it for sure. Uh, Ken Bissler, uh, questions about your work, especially in the immediate aftermath. You, you managed to um, wrangle a, a private uh, ship. Uh, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation wrote a big check to get you close to get data very soon after things happened. Uh, and um, the question comes up time and again, uh, were you, uh, any of your team, were you concerned about your own personal health? Uh, good question. Uh, you said I tracked the cesium and that's certainly, uh, we had ways to measure our own exposure while we were out there, both uh, what was coming from the atmosphere, the fallout, uh, what was in the seawater that we were traversing. So we had ways to know we were not in harm's way. I, I'm not that brave. Someone said earlier, Ken wants to measure the water in the tanks. Actually, I don't want to get that close to the tanks as me. I, I want to be offshore a little bit uh, with the levels are quite low, but there are people who can do that. And it, it does bring up, I really realized early on is one, we should do everything we can to help assess the situation. Damage was so severe on land that people were very busy with that cleanup, with measuring those levels. And so I had the, in some ways, luxury coming in the West to just do what I can do best, which is help on the ocean side and gather people. But, you know, there was no quick way to get, uh, and we have no strong federal programs in the US to do ocean weed reactivity. So it took the largesse of the Boy Foundation, uh, later on individuals giving us 20 bucks uh, 10 bucks to gather that money and do crowdfunding. That model worked. I'm still frustrated to this day that we haven't built up in the US federal programs to a better job. You know, think about the global situation where we share the common ocean. 400 reactors are uh, near coastlines or draining rivers into the ocean. And every country that operates these should have the capabilities to monitor what happens in the ocean when there is an accident like this. And even when there isn't, right? That's just as important. Well, uh, I, I would never say don't fund that kind of effort at a governmental level, but the fact that uh, necessity was the mother of invention and it encouraged a grassroots effort, which you led, which has direct parallels to what happened with SafeCast, uh, giving individuals that empowerment uh, is a very potent thing. And, and if nothing else, it gives them uh, confidence uh, and, and you know, ultimately um, 
if the data is in your hand in a device you own, that's transparent, isn't it? So uh, uh, Professor Kanda, I'm curious, uh, same question to you. you. Your research began almost immediately after the meltdowns. Were you concerned about your safety and, and do you continue to have any concerns along those lines? Well, at the initial stage, we took all the care, but, right, but during the uh, course of the uh, research, we did find out that the level on the ocean was well, well, safe enough for us in particular, but we did take care of the uh, level of the samples we took, took from the bottom sediment or something, but the, uh, for us researchers and the crew members on the ship, it was quite safe uh, on the sea. Here's a question, uh, uh, Professor Sharmasam from the uh, audience. Uh, this recent earthquake, which occurred in February, uh, 7.4 in magnitude, uh, you know, it's a logarithmic scale. So going from 7.4 to nine is, is a very dramatic difference. However, it was enough uh, to get people's attention, particularly in that part of the world. The, the question is, did it affect things in some manner? Did it shake loose additional uh, radioisotopes uh, that need to be tracked and studied? And should that be of concern? I think sure that this is a concern because uh, each time we have an earthquake, we say maybe we, we, we should have more water coming out, coming into the sea uh, um, from the site itself. And uh, I don't know if Ken was able to see something in, in, in the water, but uh, regarding the fish, uh, it doesn't seem to have a, a clear impact on, on, on the fish that were sampled by uh, during the monitoring. Uh, even if one fish was, uh, was found to have high level just after the earthquake, I don't think it is uh, cl clearly related to the, to the earthquake, but we, we, we don't know really. They suppose that this fish was coming from, from uh, the arbor in front of the, of the plant. But we, it's the reason why we, really we have to monitor continuously the, 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 the environment that might be seawater and, 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 and fish as well. So it, it's really always a concern when there is some, some event on the site. Uh, it's really, we have to, to look at it very carefully, that's for sure. As we, it, yeah, go ahead, Ken. If, if I may, but it's very hard sometimes after small events like that, small relative to 2011, to get information. So TEPCO did release a couple of statements that were picked up by the media. The ones that I was paying the closest attention to is that the water levels changed inside some of the buildings. Now that implies to be potential damage to this water that they're collecting. Is that going to mean more tanks are needed every day, every week? So that will affect this decision on what to do with it. Uh, and also shifting, as we talked about earlier, several inches on their platforms, their bases. Now those were claimed to be leaks that were contained. I've seen nothing in the ocean suggest release to the ocean in this case, but it's mm -hmm. sometimes frustratingly hard to get quick answers to uh, important questions like you just addressed. Here's a question we can all probably take a whack at. It's a very complicated one, which could take a long time, but I, I'd like to start on it actually. Why did Fukushima uh, Daiichi suffer a meltdown, but others like Daini or uh, Onagawa? Did not, and uh, I, I'm gonna. I have to give a plug for a film I did uh, for PBS Nova called "Nuclear Meltdown Disaster." It's an hour of great detail on this very subject. Uh, there were a lot of things that uh, happened: um, bad luck and bad planning at Fukushima Daiichi, which caused what happened. But it's very interesting when you look at Fukushima Daini, which is, um, as I recall, five six kilometers away, very close, um, and was really um, just a, a hair's breadth away from having a repeat scenario. Were it not for one generator and the heroic efforts of a couple of hundred plant workers to string a, a mile long cable to maintain the cooling pumps on, on the reactor, uh, it too might very well have melted down. So uh, let's elaborate on that a little bit further. Asby, one, if you wanna share a few thoughts on why uh, Fukushima uh, Daiichi suffered its fate. Yeah, 
bad luck was a big part of it. Uh, of course, as Dr. Kanda pointed out, um, you know, one of the initial um, original sins was the decision to excavate that 30 meter high cliff and site the plants closer to uh, the the sea level uh, to make it easier to pump water. Uh, and that also, you know, that's why they were exposed to the tsunami. And that's also why we have this influx of groundwater. Uh, but yeah, it was luck and, and exactly which generators were damaged, also leadership. Um, I think uh, the plant leader, the plant manager at Daini understood quickly and motivated his team to quickly string that cable that you mentioned. And that was really what saved it. So um, leadership, uh, you know, some luck. Uh, in the case of Onagawa, that was on a high cliff. They didn't excavate uh, the, the, the cliffside to lower it. And that plant ended up being uh, an evacuation center for people. It was one of the safest places uh, around. So people actually you know, uh, evacuating and, and, and sheltering there. So uh, lots of reasons why, but the leadership, uh, original decisions and uh, luck all play a part. Professor Kanda, would you like to add some thoughts on, on Daiichi and why it in particular uh, suffered the loss? As we mostly uh, told uh, all the answers, so I <laughs> have little things to add. He's good at that. All right, I, 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 I have a better question for you anyway. I, I'm curious what you, and I'll ask this of all the researchers, um, in 10 years of study, uh, what's been the biggest, most surprising thing that you have discovered, Professor Kanda? Well, there are many, many discoveries. Um, uh, not myself, but my, my colleague scientists all around Japan and, or, and I mean, all around the world. So I have some program to pick up one, but the, I, I would repeat again uh, one more that the, this, the, as an ocean, ocean scientist, I mean, the Pacific uh, water flow cycle was proven. That was one thing I mostly feel uh, astonishing. So uh, I have a question for you, Professor Sharma Sam from the audience. Steve is asking, were any food products imported to the US or Europe tested separately from Japan, which begs a question, how do the limits in Japan compare to other countries? So there is two question, if I understand well. In fact, uh, the, the food was, which was imported from Japan were, were in, indeed tested in Europe and I think it was the same in the US. Uh, before entering the Europe and the US, they were tested again uh, not only by the Japanese, but by uh, the, the European or the, the US people. And um, what was the, the, the second part of the question? Sorry, it was uh, about the limit. The, the question is how do the, uh, say, the, the quote unquote safe levels differ from country to country, Japan relative to say the United States, for example? Uh, in fact, it's, it's uh, what I said previously, it's uh, in Fukushima, the lower, the, the limit because the population in, in Japan eats a lot of uh, seafood and uh, the consumption was really high compared to, for example, the US or even Europe. So it was uh, necessary for them to lower the, the limits. And uh, it's true that there is not an international, con uh, an international consensus about the limit. We have slightly different numbers in the US and, and Europe even if they are close, it's 1,000 for, for, I think, US, and 100, 250 for Europe or the rivers. I don't, don't remember exactly. But we have not the same, exactly the same number. And even in case of accident, uh, for example, in Norway, after the Chernobyl accident, the level were increased because they, they, they considered that it was necessary to, to allow the people that um, that were uh, that eat some kind of uh, of uh, meat to allow to have higher levels in order they, they can eat this uh, this meat even if it was higher. So it's really complicated and it's it's really it's really that you have to take into account the food habits 
of the population. Can well, as, there, yeah, go ahead. Uh, would there be, uh, I, you know, you got some to add, but just work this in if you would. Would there be uh, some value to having a universal standard the world over? Uh, yeah, I mean, there are UN standards for food, but other countries choose to set that for their country. And often, I'll call those political decisions sometimes because the science is exactly the same, right? Uh, the point I want to make is, you know, I don't, we don't want to be dismissive of people's concerns. You know, wouldn't it be nice if there was zero cesium in fish? Every additional amount of these radioisotopes we add increases health risk, but we have to set some bounds. We know when they're going to cause harm that we can measure. And so that's seen in increases in populations of cancers. So we put that in, we look at diets, uh, we being other scientists, that's not what I do. And they try and make a guess of where could people be above and below that. And that's a limit that's talking about seafood eaten every day. So the single fish that you might go out and catch yourself and eat that's above that limit doesn't put you over a threshold that they think is gonna give you an increased health effect that can be measured. It doesn't mean it's zero, but we're long out of that. You know, every, I like to say we live in a radioactive world. Everything we do, every time we fly a plane, everywhere we go exposes us. Uh, we just want to, as scientists, I think, get, at least I do, get the information out there so people can make informed choices. You know, whether you eat organic food or not, I don't, again, don't wanna trivialize the radiation risk, but you know, we have choices to make. Universal standards would help a lot because you can't uh, taste, smell, feel, or know when you're being exposed. But there are choices that we make, and that's what governments do when they accept one of these limits uh, for their particular population. All right, so we're getting close to the end. We, we, I want you all on record on this. By a show of hands, who among you uh, is comfortable eating seafood from Fukushima waters? Raise your hand if so. All right, it's unanimous, folks. There you have it. So um, let's... Uh, I, let's think about the next 10 years. We're going we're to plan our next uh, session when we meet uh, 10 years from now, right in this very place. Hopefully we won't be in a pandemic. Maybe we could be in Japan <laughs> together uh, on a stage. I think we'd all prefer that. So Professor Kanda, uh, what do you think the, you know, go, peer into your crystal ball, what do you think the issues will be 10 years from now? Will they be very similar to what we're talking about today? Well, uh, <clears throat> we do have around uh, 30,000 people, or some say 60,000 people are still unable to return home due to the Fukushima accident. So I, it would be quite difficult for me to tell about 10 years, but I myself is quite optimistic about uh, the future. And the workers, the progress of the decommissioning and the uh, clean up the site it took much decades, as you say, but we uh, certainly have some progress. Of course, we do have a lot of di uh, difficulties about the tanks and the water issue, but the, uh, we do we will do have uh, progress. And the, uh, uh, yes, I am certainly quite optimistic about uh, ten years uh, after ten years of this uh, period. I think Ken Bissler. Yeah, I do hope to be sharing that meal with you, Miles, and fellow panelists in Japan in 10 years and even sooner. But uh, I think it boils down to uh, three words, you know, is it safe? And that's just a, a word I don't like to use in lectures because safe is kind of a, a value judgment. But, you know, I go back, I've done studies recently at the Marshall Islands, and 75 years ago, we were testing nuclear weapons. We go back there three generations later, they're still asking, what is the level in the ocean? What's the level of the food I'm eating? How might that affect our health risks? And so even as levels get lower, the public will still have these questions. And what I hope in 10 years is we're still trying to give them answers, that we still have a cadre of scientists, independent government agencies, others looking at those questions, because it's just as important to know when the levels are low as when they're high. Uh, and so I think that's where I think we'll be asking that same question uh, in response to accidents like this, is it safe? Sabine Charmasson. Oh, I hope that we will have learned a lot from this disaster on different point of view. And from my scientific point of view, I think, I hope that uh, 
we will have learned a lot on the fate of fragile nuclei in the marine environment, and especially with biota regarding the biota and the effect maybe on biota on the long term, because the contamination will last for long because cesium-137 is 30, at a half-life of 30 years. Uh, before the Fukushima accident, I remember sometimes uh, speaking with scientists saying that, oh, we have to, to, to work on another radionuclide than cesium because we, we thought we, we, we knew everything about, about cesium. But um, any event, I would should say, any event brings its uh, share of valuable knowledge and reminds us of the humility we must have about what we know. Asby, you get the final thought. Um, yes, I'm looking at this and thinking we're going to be dealing with this for a long time. Uh, I meet uh, people in Fukushima, do workshops with high school kids, and realize it's going to be their problem uh, through their adulthood, and maybe they'll have to teach their kids about this. So uh, we'll be dealing with it for, for generations, really, and, and that's very sobering on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing some of the wonderful efforts I'm seeing in Fukushima, rebuilding communities, the energy issues, new kinds of agriculture, to see See these bearing fruit and I think 10 years from now we'll see a kind of change social and, and physical landscape in, in parts of Fukushima uh, and I look forward to that a lot. All right I'm planning my next film already. Thank you all <laughs> very much. That is all the time we have. I want to thank our panelists and our keynoter Caroline Kennedy for participating. I also want to thank all of you. 750 of you, over 130 questions. Obviously we couldn't get to them all. Sorry about that. Um, we will be uh, repeating this event, uh, uh, you, or excuse me, you can uh, register for, um, I apologize, I got some stuff from the morning event. Uh, I want to remind everyone to take a look at the virtual poster session to learn about the most recent research related to Fukushima Daiichi. You can find it uh, by going to the same page and clicking on the virtual poster session at the top of the page. Each poster includes audio recordings in Japanese and English describing the research. In addition, on March 24th, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution will hold another virtual event to look at natural and human-caused radiation in the ocean and in the environment all around us. Dr. Ken Bissler uh, will appear uh, at that event uh, as well. Joining him will be Dr. Sh uh, Shaheen Duji from Texas A&M University and Rio Morimoto from Princeton. That will be from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, March 24th, uh, on our popular Ocean Encounter series. Um, also, we want to thank our uh, sponsors uh, for this event, which was, uh, I'm sorry, I'm doing this a little bit out of order because I had the scripts a little bit. You know, we had a long day here, people. I hope you understand. We've been in Japan and the United States in one day. It's rather dizzying these days. None of this would be possible without the support of our sponsors. The Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's uh, Morse Colloquium and Center for Marine and Environment Radioactivity and the Atmosphere and Ocean Research Institute at the University of Tokyo. If you enjoyed this event, you can join SafeCast for a global online event commemorating the 10th anniversary of the 2011 disasters and the founding of SafeCast March 12th in the US and March 13th in Japan. Information is on the, uh, yet the URL on your screen. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, this has been a stimulating day and it's been very interesting reflecting on this event. Hard to believe it's been 10 years. I'm Miles O'Brien. On behalf of the team that helped organize this event, Thank you so much for joining us.